In this episode, I sincerely hope to resurrect mechanical Jesus so that he can reiterate for you the six laws of ghetto engineering for next time you're fabricating a spare battery box for your ute, mate. And if that doesn't work and he doesn't show, I'll just tell you what they are because how hard can this possibly be? I'm John Gadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Cheap, I say. Website. Card. Now, I've got this question from a dude just like you, only named Robin Endersby, who says... I note that there are engineering specifications regarding restraining the human mass within a vehicle by way of seat and seatbelt anchorages and the use thereof. They don't get thereofs very often in questions from you, I must say. This is next level, isn't there? There's not only specifications, but there's a lot of laws about that stuff and, you know, standards compliance kind of things because it's so bad. (coughs) I think you'd agree if you hit something hard and kind of unyielding and the human mass ejects itself... (coughs) through the friggin' windscreen. That's a suboptimal day out there on the road, isn't it? That's why we have these laws and specifications, I'd suggest. So anyway, Robin goes on and says, However, I cannot find such specific guidance for the slab of beer on the back seat, always important, or fixtures such as water tanks and batteries within a van conversion for the road to dingo piss creek. Australian icon, the beer on the back seat, and Dingo Piss Creek. A battery under the bonnet is placed in a formed steel base, says Robin, with a steel bridle and six millimetre bolts. I saw a movie like that once. In the back of a four-wheel drive or van, a similar battery may be placed in a plastic box wedged or strapped in place. Yeah, or you could just do it properly. Are there legal guidelines or useful rules of thumb for such restraint? 13 points out of a possible 10 for questions there, Robin, but I also suggest you have opened rather the can o worms, haven't you? So let's deal with the obvious thing first, which would be the box of beer or whatever, Christ knows what, in the back of your car. Okay, so the problem with unrestrained loads is Newton's second law of motion, which kind of says that F equals MA. So maybe it's the first law, which just says that things want to keep travelling how they're travelling unless they're subjected to uh, some other force. Now, if you've got a box of beer in practice and you have a crash, right, you've got to think about, well, what is the possible crash scenario here? Most crashes happen in a more or less horizontal plane. Your car is moving in a more or less horizontal plane. It's likely to hit things that involve the exertion of crash-type loads and forces that are more or less horizontal. And I know there are vertical influences, like you can tip over onto the roof and roll and things of that nature. That's far less common. I'd also suggest that there's really no epidemic of Tins O Campbell's soup just clocking people in the back of the head and killing them. That's not a significant mode of injury in what I would call high mechanism crashes, okay? So if you are stupid enough to put a two, four, six block on the parcel shelf, and if you don't know what that is, stand by. Okay, so this beautiful device is a 246 block. It's two inches by four inches by six inches, and it's steel. It's got a few threaded holes in it. It's got 23 holes, I think, in total. I haven't counted them, but that's usually how they roll. Anywho, now it's got more than that, hasn't it? Three by five is 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Shouldn't have second-guessed myself. It is actually 23. So there you go. Anyway, these things are beautiful, quite hefty, however. You could beat someone to death with one, hypothetically. And if you're stupid enough to put it on the parcel shelf and you have a big crash, it could beat you to death easily. But I'd suggest if you get heavy shit and you put it in the boot of Yo Sedan or you put it in the footwell of an unused rear, like second row seat, 
or you just put it, if you've got a hatch or a wagon, and you just put it kind of against the back seats as opposed to just anywhere in the back. The heavy shit against the back seats or in any of those other locations, it's very unlikely to hurt you in a crash because A, crashes are unlikely if you're paying attention and you're not pissed out of your head. And B, even if you crash, then if the load is in those kinds of places, the Newton's second law, D'Alembert's principle kind of loads exerted by inertial forces on that unrestrained thing is unlikely to magic it up to head height and just chuck it at you. Uh, Pro tip, you're also sitting in a seat, so anything that damages you would have to get through the seat or hit you without hitting the seat from behind, which is something of a Cirque du Soleil trick also. (coughs) I think you'd agree. Okay, so there's that. Obviously, there are load restraint kinds of countermeasures that you can put in place like cargo bays often have cargo nets manufacturers are shit properly shit at putting proper load type anchorage points in passenger cars and i can only infer from all of this and the fact that it's not regulatory or ANCAP style imperative to have proper load restraint for the things that you carry in a car that this is just not a common mechanism of injury. Now, if you're a peanut and you put a whole spare wheel and tyre on top of all of your shit in the cargo bay and drive at 100 k's an hour, then, yeah, you have a crash and it could easily clock you from behind, which would be terrible. And this is one of the things I hate, I hate about space saver spares because often you have a flat out there on the highway, you fit the space saver, where do you put the full-sized flat tyre? You know, all your shit's in the back, you're on the way to holidays or something, you're in a hurry, you're running late because you've just spent 20 minutes, you know, changing a tyre. You put it on the top and you're a bit distracted, you're cursing and because of that you crash and the tyre can clock you. So, you know, countermeasures for this kind of thing are important. If you have to do that and ride around with a spare tyre in the back, okay, Unpack your shit, put the spare tyre against the rear seat, okay? Right up the front of the load uh, space in the car, okay? Do that and that would mitigate the risk. And then stop and get the tyre repaired or replaced as quickly as possible because that's a dangerous situation to be in, having something that big just free to move in the cargo bay. You know, like that's unthinkable, okay? But the shop's box of beer, things of that nature. Just shove it somewhere. It's not going to move horizontally if you do crash. And then, dude, you'll be okay. As for, you know, things like batteries, okay, this is the bit where I'm expecting, you know, it's not Missouri here. We're a long way from Missouri here, but I was hoping to see Mechanical Jesus right about now. I guess I'll have to just uh, stand in for him and reveal to you the laws of ghetto engineering, because I want to talk to you about the strength of materials. And this is really a a topic that you could never get to the bottom of. I mean, you could never know everything about the strength of materials, but there's a lot of people who manufacture, if that's the right word, in their sheds a lot of shit, and they have really no idea about the strength of materials or how to approach this from a basic rules of thumb kind of point of view. Like, let us not go to university and all become engineers because that is a proper brain bleeder. Like, it really is. And a lot of the shit that they talk about in all of those lectures is completely useless for the rest of your life. Bit of personal experience talking there. I've never solved a differential equation in any place other than an assignment at university or an exam at university kind of thing, okay? So I'm sure if I'd gone to work for NASA, that would be a different story, but hey, here we are in the fat cave. So how do you approach this stuff? And I'd I'd suggest that we need to talk about the general approach to fabbing something up in your own fat cave. Like you might need to carry a second spare tire and you might want to restrain it responsibly. Or you might want to carry a gas bottle or as Robin says, another battery or something of that nature. So I've got these six laws that Jesus was supposed to be here for, but you know, he's notoriously unreliable mechanical Jesus. You know, he's up there doing high level stuff. Ghetto engineering, the six fundamental laws, okay? The first law is just buy something off the shelf, dude, because 
Chinese mass production and Amazon and eBay and Google as a search engine to just, it's the ultimate catalog when you're looking for a battery restraint system or a LPG bottle restraint system or anything of that nature. You can find it. Well, you can't find it, but Google can find it and all you've got to do is hit buy now. So somebody else, however perfectly or imperfectly, has done the research and the design and manufactured a thing for the job that you want to do. And guaranteed, that is better than your first attempt at it. And even if it's not perfect, you might be able to adapt it. And it'll be starting from, instead of starting from the bottom of the barrel, you're already halfway to the surface. So just buy something off the shelf if it's available, okay? The second law is if you can't do that, Dude, do what I'd do, which would be rip off somebody else's good design, all right? Now, what I mean by that is if you've got second spare wheel and tyre and you want to put it on the crossbars of some roof rack and you're wondering how to attach it to the crossbars, the first place I would look is every other spare wheel and tyre attachment point that I could see. I'd be walking through a car park at Woolies and I'd see some pimped friggin' Hilux just over there on the other side of the car park. I'd go over there and I'd get out my trusty phone and I'd take photographs of this and that and I would have a look at the stud and using my, you know, eye I would just measure the size, the diameter of the studs and things like that, you know, the material behind it that is bolted to and just get an appreciation for how somebody else has done this competently and then emulate that. And by emulate, I mean just nakedly rip it off, dude. Law number three, over-engineer the shit out of it. So what I mean by that is err on the side of conservatism. If an 8mm bolt, like an M8 bolt, is going to be good enough, use M10. Because I'll just, I have cheat notes here, I might as well refer to them so that I'm not just bullshitting to you with the volume on 13. Like, the proof load for M8 is 3 tonnes, roughly, okay? The proof load for M10 is like 5 tonnes. So if you just go from M8 to M10, which is an infinitesimal increase in price if you're buying the fasteners, you get a 60% increase in quote-unquote, I fucking hate this term, but strength, okay? So just over-engineer the shit out of whatever you're doing, right? It costs hardly anything to do that. Put a bit more weld in there. Instead of using 2 millimeter steel, use 4 millimeter thick flat bar or something, okay? You get what I'm talking about here. Just err on the side of overdoing it because... If you're a proper engineer in a proper R&D facility doing proper design for proper mass production, one of the biggest jobs of all time is optimization, like making your design as efficient as it can be. Because if you make something efficient, it uses the least possible amount of material and there's also the minimised number of manufacturing operations to get it across the line and productionized, right? And if you do both of those things, least material, least number of, fewest number of operations, then, you know, it's cheap, isn't it? It's a real way to cut costs. And that's why when you go to a wreckers, for example, you can find a part that will suit your car, but you can't find too many other parts that you can repurpose too easily to do anything else because the designs are optimised, right? Right. And you're not optimising because you don't have the resources to optimise here in a fat cave. You know, you don't have the durability testing and the FEA and all of that crap that you need to do proper optimised design, right? So just over-engineer the shit out of it, dude. Where are we? Fourth law. The fourth law is possibly my favourite. Throw away the prototype because the fundamental problem with all DIY is that everyone's making prototypes. And there's nothing wrong with prototypes. The mistake is that's the finished product also, right? And that every time you make something, the worst version of it is the first. Like first is worst, okay? And that means just make something and learn. You learn so much making the first version. And then 
just chuck it away or cut it up and use it for parts. Like section it up and just practice welding on the bits or use the bits for something else. I don't care. But just don't use them as the finished product because guaranteed if you just do it one more time, the thing that you produce will be at least twice as polished, twice as good. It'll just be twice as slick and you'll be twice as happy with it and twice as pleased that you did actually take the time to do it twice. It doesn't take you twice as long to do it twice. It probably takes you 50% longer than the first one because of all the learning curve things about doing that, right? Number five, <laughs> and this is because humanity always invents a better idiot. Don't do patently dodgy shit, okay? I'll give you an example of patently dodgy shit, which I saw one day. <laughs> and it's so lucky that nobody was killed. All right, I got this tradie. I'm driving behind this tradie on a freeway, right? And he's got the big long piece of PVC tube with the threaded on caps on the roof rack. And I'm presuming that he's using that. He looked like a sparky, right? So I'm presuming that he's using that to carry big long lengths of electrical conduit, right? And that's a great solution for carrying electrical conduit because it keeps it all together. It doesn't flap around and it, it's just an efficient, elegant way to handle that problem, okay? So anyway, there's a real sharp stop. And the unexpected aspect to this is a friggin' crowbar comes through the front cap as he's under brakes. Like the crowbar's been riding right up the back of this PVC envelope, okay, and he's hit the brakes just ever so slightly too hard, and the crowbar's going, and of course, a PVC end cap is transparent to a crowbar, and it just goes like this straight through and javelins itself down the road as it decelerates from a friggin' 100 kilometres an hour or something, and it's just so lucky that it didn't skewer 100 cars on the way through. And he kind of sheepishly pulled over into the breakdown lane and picked it up, and Christ knows what happened, because by then I was past him. But if I had had the bat pumpy, I would have probably withdrawn it from its holster and had a stern chat with him about violating law number five of ghetto engineering, which is... Don't do patently dodgy shit, dude. Like, don't hold heavy shit onto a roof rack with electrical tape or duct tape. That's a bad idea. You know it's a bad idea. And yet people do this shit and they get away with it and they get away with it and they get away with it until they do not. So, you know, don't do patently dodgy shit. And finally, the sixth law, right... Know your own limitations, and that means pay somebody with actual skill to do shit that you can't do professionally, proficiently, whatever, okay? And that means if you're welding up, I don't know, the handles on a barbecue plate, okay, great. You don't have to be a good welder to do that. That's totally fine, dude. You can learn as you go. You know, you might want to put a little bit of angle around the whole thing, couple of legs that fold out, couple of handles made out of some relatively thin round bar so that they don't get too hot and you can lift it off, whatever, okay? You know the kind of thing I'm talking about. If a handle on a barbecue plate fails as you've picked it up, like what's the worst that's going to happen? It's not as bad as if a trailer hitch fails, is it? So what I'm saying is, if you're not a competent welder, if you're not a trade-level welder who knows about uh, penetration, fusion, undercut, things of that nature, right? If you don't know about that, which rods to use in which situations and stuff like that, and you're welding up something that is properly mission critical, then, dude, just go to the local steel shop. They probably fabricate all kinds of things all day long and just take the parts and say, dude, can you weld these proficiently in it for us? Not going to cost you all that much. Might even just be, you know, a box of beer that you've got down in the footwell kind of grade job. Who knows? But they'll do a better job than you because that's the shit that they do all day long, especially if you're a vitally important customer service operative Monday to Friday and all they're doing is, you know, the mad Jedi art of welding. Now, I also want to talk to you, now that we've got the laws under control, I want to talk to you about just an appreciation for... You know, the basic strength of materials, right? And if you're fabbing stuff up out of steel, all right, this is a piece of what I would call structural grade, low carbon, hot rolled flat bar. Like it's just, quote unquote, mild steel. It's got a yield strength of about 
250 MPa and it probably has an ultimate tensile strength of about 450 to 550 MPa. Now what does all of that mean? Okay, What that means in practice, if the yield strength of this, that means in between where it stretches and bounces back to its original shape just like that and where you bend it like, you know, into a U-shape and it doesn't bounce back, okay? There's a boundary and that's the yield point. There's a particular amount of stress there. It's 250 MPa. And if you really want to get to the bottom of that, MPa's, megapascals, are really newtons per square millimetre. And that means 250 newtons per square millimetre. So it means 25 kilograms per square millimetre. It's easier to think in terms of tensile stress, like stretching this to the point where it breaks or deforms permanently, or compressive strength, although long things like this are not likely to fail in compression, they're more likely to fail by bending because of this thing called the slenderness ratio. But 25 kilos per square millimetre, so this is about 25 by 3, so there's 75 square millimetres kind of thing of cross-sectional area. So if you load this up in shear, like if you put it here and put another load on it right here and it's in shear, before it fails, you've probably got something like 25 times 75, which is about 2,000, isn't it? Something like that. You know, it's probably about two tonnes to shear it off. Okay, And it is pretty hard work to shear it off in a machine like a shear that is designed specifically to do that. So, yeah, okay, there's a lot of uh, strength, quote-unquote, built into even small pieces of steel such as this. So let's think about welding it, like what are the guidelines for welding it? So if you don't want the weld to fail, you need the weld to be at least as quote unquote strong as the thing you're welding to, right? So I'd suggest that if there's 75 square millimetres of cross-sectional area in something like that, you'd want 75 square millimetres of weld area so that the weld was quote unquote as strong as the thing you're welding to. That makes kind of sense, okay? And I know every engineer in the house is rolling their eyes and going, oh Jesus, you didn't pay attention, did you? This is a simplification, right? It's like if you don't understand bending stress and you don't understand all of that convoluted stuff and you're really just putting simple structures together, then try to put as much weld down as the cross-sectional area of the thing you are welding to. Welding is not glue, okay? It's fu it's a fusion process. So, you know, you're trying to... If you're joining two bits of this stuff together, just taper the ends or bevel the ends off a little bit and weld right down so that there's a total amount of weld in there equal to the cross-sectional area. It's called a full penetration butt weld in this case, like if you're putting two things together like this, right? You just grind the ends down so that they meet at more or less a point and then you fill the whole thing up with weld. You're not gluing over the top, you're fusing it together. In a full penetration butt weld, you have to assume that the weld is as strong as the thing. Now, if you're talking about welding rods, okay, in Australia, if you go to Bunnings, welding is really accessible, stick welding in particular, right, because you don't need a cylinder of gas and the machine is really simple. It's just an inverter that pumps out DC, right? And you can get 10 amp ones of those and you can get them for under 200 bucks, okay? And they, they will weld a two and a half millimeter electrode like this. Now, if you go to Bunnings, I'm not sure if you can see this, but if you go to Bunnings, you can buy electrodes like this, guaranteed, lay down Mazare off the shelf, it'll be what's called a 6013, okay? That'll be probably the only welding rods that are joint like Bunnings stocks. Now, there's no problem with that, 6013. The way this works is the 60 means strength, tensile strength in 1,000 PSI. So the, tensiles, the, the tensile strength of this material is 60,000 PSI, which is about 400 MPa, okay? So roughly the same as mild steel, okay? And the one just means you can weld in any position. So you can weld on the flat and you can weld vertically up or down or you can weld overhead, okay? And then the three just relates to the actual electrode and its functionality, okay? And if you're watching 
any one of a thousand US welding channels on YouTube, you might not get the nuances of 6013 because they don't use 6013 very often. America tends to be much more of a 6010, 7018 environment, right? And 6010 is a real hot burning, deep penetrating, root pass kind of electrode. It just gets in there and it freezes fast. It's as ugly as shit, but it really gets in there down into the bottom of the joint. So that's why they use it. And then they top it off with a thing called a 7018, which is that. And that freezes slower, looks really nice. It's notionally stronger, but there's a sort of use by time frame with 7018s. They're called low highs, right? Low hydrogen. And it's because you got to open the box and use the electrodes. Otherwise, atmospheric moisture gets into the uh, flux and it will degrade its strength. So that matters if you're pipeline welding or structural welding. Not so important if you're just putting a barbecue plate together in your fat cave, all right? So the thing I was talking about not getting from YouTube channels is if you're welding a couple of things together like this, okay, I hope you can see this. If you're welding this to that, okay, and you've got a weld in here, there's two angles, right? There's the angle in between the two bits of work. So in this case, you cut that in half and you'd be welding over here at 90 degrees. And there's a rule of thumb for welding that says if you've got slag, you drag. So you're going to drag the electrode this way and your work angle comes over here at 5 to 10 degrees in America. But 6013, if you're taking American advice and welding in Australia, 6013 is notorious for slag inclusions, right, which severely degrade the strength of the weld because it doesn't fuse to both sides of the joint. And what you've got to do to overcome that is just turn the current up a bit higher and increase the drag angle. Okay, so instead of just your 5 to 10, you might come over here at 30 or even 45 degrees and that'll use more what they call arc force to get down into here and really penetrate into the joint, which is what you want, all right? I know this is probably more than you ever wanted to know about welding, so you can buy 7018s. 7018s are really nice electrodes to use, by the way. They, they, they freeze so slow that they look really slick. Like, it's a beautiful-looking weld bead, if weld beads can be beautiful. And it comes out really nice off the gun. They can be a bit hard to restart, but it's a beautiful thing. And uh, they're part of the reason they're thicker, you might be able to see that too, they're a bit thicker. It's because the uh, flux is full of iron powder, which increases what they call the deposition rate. So it puts more weld in there for the same sort of period of time. They also require more amps. So there's that, okay? That's what I sort of say about welding. Now, these welding rods, 60 and 70, Put thousand psi. That's roughly the same as the strength of mild steel. So I just err on the side of putting at least the same amount of weld in place as the thing you're welding. So measure the thickness, multiply it by the length, and make sure you've got at least that much weld bead in place to manage the strength in those situations so that the weld doesn't fail first. Okay, and I'm taking a bit of time to talk about that because Welding is one of the common processes that you can do easily in your shed, and it's not that hard to learn, but it is a bit Jedi. You just have to burn quite a few rods and uh, lay down quite a few beads into things that don't matter before you can do it proficiently. It's a properly Jedi skill. To develop it, you just have to uh, have what the Americans call hood time. So just put in the hood time and you'll be okay at it. Certainly okay for not super demanding things like beams that people's lives depend on or pipelines that carry superheated steam. If you're just doing ghetto fab, you'll be okay at it. And the final thing to talk about, I guess, is these babies, which are even more accessible, and that would be threaded fasteners, okay? And I'd suggest that one of the things to realise about threaded fasteners is that they're much stronger than you think. More fasteners, obviously better than not enough because we're in the business of over-designing in the ghetto. But 
one of the ways you can ensure that you're getting more bang for your buck out of the fasteners is instead of going just to Bunnings and buying fasteners, this thing is an M12 by 1.75 socket head cap screw and matching high tensile nut. This is a class 10.9 fastener, so that's in the middle of the high tensile range. So just go for the 10.9s. They can be hex head, they don't have to be socket head, you know. And you'll get a bit more quote unquote strength out of them. Now, just to give you an appreciation for the kinds of loads that these 10.9 fasteners can withstand. If we start at M6, 1.6 tonnes is what they call the proof load for M6. And you look at an M6 fastener and you think that's the same as hanging a light car off there, 1.6 tonnes, Jesus. I don't recommend that because we're in the business of over-engineering and putting redundancy and factors of safety into all designs, but that's probably scary. You know, I, I, I never cease to be amazed at how strong fasteners actually are. M8, the proof load is three tonnes. Okay, for M10, the proof load is five tons. For M12, which would be this baby, the proof load is seven tons. Like seven tons. That's three and a half Hiluxes hanging off that. That's amazingly strong stuff, right? And M16, which is probably overkill for ghetto engineering in your shed, but reasonably accessible. Like most drill presses and certainly most you know, battery drills will not accept a 16 millimeter drill. So good luck getting the hole in whatever. So there's that to consider. But for M16, the proof load is 13 tons. And I suggest you get yourself one of these if you're gonna deal with uh, fasteners because it's the bolting handbook. This one's from Hobson's, but they, all the bolt manufacturers make these handbooks. They give them away from time to time. And they tell you all sorts of things about the assembly torque, for example. and you know, if you've got all the basic tools, get one of these, get a torque wrench, because then you'll be able to ensure that your tightening of fasteners such as this is kind of Goldilocks, okay? This is a Warren and Brown torque wrench, so it is Australian, it is particularly slick to use too, it's kind of next level from Chinesium, and it's it's really nice, half inch drive, and it just feels slick, it's got this locking collar that you, you know, it's easy to adjust, but once you let go of the ring, it stays where you set it, right? So that's kind of nice. It just feels next level. Anyway, I'll probably do a bit more of a chat about that torque wrench down the track, but Warren and Brown's been around for years. It's an Australian company. They're really good. Just check them out on their website. They are slightly more expensive than something you'd buy on eBay or Amazon, but you do get what you pay for, so there's that. Now, in terms of the... Assembly torques, this is only for class 10.9, but if you don't want to rush out and get one of these bolted joint handbooks. M6, okay, 13 Newton meters is the recommended assembly torque for class 10.9. And when you tighten it up like that, it's probably exerting about seven or 800 kilos of clamping force, which to me is amazing for such a flimsy looking fastener. Anyway, M8 is 30 Newton meters, M10 is 60 Newton meters, M12, which is this baby, is 110-ish Newton meters, and M16, 270, which is a lot. It's actually outside the range of a torque wrench like this. So there you go. These things are really strong. Now, if you're designing something to use on a car, all right, you've got to say, well, how strong do I need to make something? And that is a whole university degree right there, you know, structural design and testing and all of that stuff. But I'd suggest that let's take a nine kilo gas bottle. You have to realize that nine kilos is the payload of the gas bottle. It's the weight of the gas, right? So the gas bottle itself probably weighs something like 15 kilos. And if it were to be involved in something of a shunt, you'd have to assume that it would experience loads like 20 Gs, right? So if you are in an accelerating frame of reference at 20 Gs and you weigh 15 kilos like a gas bottle, that's 300 kilos of restraint that needs to be applied for it not to just rip itself out of whatever and throw itself into the scenery, okay? And we'd all agree that the gas bottle staying connected to the trailer is a good idea. And that's why, you know, the first law is buy something off the shelf or rip off somebody else's capable design, right? If you're doing it yourself, you have to say, well, whatever I'm putting together here, it's got to be strong enough to withstand 
300 kilos, maybe more of load. Okay, so 300 kilos, if you use, I'm simplifying this a great deal, but if you used three or even two of these bolts, they would not fail at 600 kilos. Each one of these bolts, the proof load is seven tons. So you've got 14 tons worth of quote unquote strength inside a bolt like that. And that's the proof load and it doesn't fail at the proof load. But it might fail where you've drilled the hole. It, the, the thing that you've drilled into might fail. And I'd suggest that it might be a good idea to put some sort of load spreading device in that areas such as you know a washer like this they make these mud guard washers which they look about two 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 and a half millimeters thick i'd have to put my glasses on and actually measure it but it's something like that you'd actually weld that in place so that you never lost it you could just tack it in place so that it was always there and then the load would be spread over a greater thickness a greater area of tube like square tube or angle or whatever you're bolting through right they also make these more significant actual load compatible washers which are a little bit dished and you can use them as well to spread the load. So there's all kinds of strategies you can use to make things strong enough but I'd suggest getting the resources together is probably the place to start with this stuff. Like getting some resources like a you know assembly talk table in a bolt handbook is a good place to start to get some appreciation for how strong is that m12 fastener exactly and then you've got to think about modes of failure like is this likely to fail or is the thing it goes through likely to fail like the wall on the square tube is that likely to fail and if that's likely to fail then weld a bit of pipe into the hole you know so that you're not bolting across a void so that you've got a complete sort of gusset thing in place to spread the load right and all of these strategies can make the difference between something being robust or just failing in service. The other thing to realise is that things made out of mild steel don't usually fail catastrophically in the one hit. In particular, they don't fail catastrophically if they get overloaded. They bend. And if you see them bend, if you come back and you see something bent, that's like that's like reality reaching out and tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, we exceeded the elastic limit here. This thing's giving you the messages that it's about to fail. So do something about it, dude, like replace it or fix it, build it better, bigger, whatever, you know. And the other thing I'd suggest about condition monitoring, they call it, is I'd look around and if you see something that you put together, it can be welded, it can be bolted, it can be anything, right? And if you see fresh rust, I'm not talking about old rust, you know that real dark brown, dirty iron oxide colour that old beams that have been rusting out in the elements go after years. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about bright orange rust, okay? Bright orange rust is a warning sign from hell that something has changed because that's fresh rust, okay? And that, that just says, hey, dude, something's changed. Something's rubbing. Something's loose. Something's whatever, and it's not right. So please look before it fails catastrophically at 100 k's an hour in traffic, Okay? The other thing I'd suggest is if you're putting something simple together, like let's say we're going to use this bolt to hold a gas bottle onto the drawbar of a trailer, which is a common application for this kind of shit, okay? And we might use four bolts like this, or we might use three, it doesn't matter. It depends on how we're going to design it. Or you could just be putting some tool together in Yo Fat Cave. Over in the other Fat Cave, I just put together a uh, A-frame gantry that lifts a thousand kilos because some of the things I move over there are too heavy for me to move, right? Getting out of the ute, you know, a big bandsaw or uh, putting a lathe together or a milling machine, something like that. It's too heavy, right? So put this gantry together. And the, the thing about that is it's bolted together. It comes in a box and it's like a, a pre-packed thing and you pull it apart it's got a million bolts and you put it together you've got two options with bolts for gantries things holding gas bottles on whatever okay option one is put the bolt in like this put the nut in like this and do it up okay and it sits there in this vertical orientation like this option two okay is this way okay and i'd say go for option two every time because if something comes loose right the bolt's going to fall out and that's going to be 
terribly obvious when you just look at it. Whereas if the nut falls off, if, the, if it comes loose and the nut just falls off, it's going to and you look at it from the top, it looks okay because you can see the head of the bolt and it's all together, but the nut's not there and you'd have to, you know, get down in the dirt and, lo and look up and check it out that way to make sure that everything was together. The only way you would know the nut was off in many situations is if you physically got under and had a look. But if you do it up this way and it all comes loose and it gets catastrophic, you can avert disaster by just seeing that it's missing if you put the bolt in that way. And I know you have to go and find another bolt in that situation, and perhaps you should have been paying more attention when it was just kind of loose like this, right? But this is a real safeguard for a lot of equipment, and I put the gantry together over in the other fat cave like that because when you've got 1,000 kilos and it's up here like that, or 800, whatever, it's enough to damage you severely if the A-frame you know, collapses catastrophically. And therefore, all I've got to do to make sure that things are basically together is go there, it's on wheels, wheel it out, have a look up there like that. If all the bolts are still in place, then they haven't fallen out vertically like that. Good to go, dude. So they're just some basic rules of thumb, guidelines, if you like. And I know this has been rather a long one, but hopefully this has given you some uh, food for thought in your own fat cave next time you're fabbing something up and anything you're bolting onto the outside of your trailer, your caravan, your ute, whatever, it's mission critical that it doesn't fail because when you're driving down the road at 60 to 110 k's an hour, that thing has acquired a significant amount of energy and therefore it has the capacity to do proper mayhem if your design fails catastrophically and you are morally obliged to make sure that that does not happen. And I am sincerely sorry that I haven't been <laughs> enough of a flippant git about that shit, but it really does matter and you've got to get it right. So in the spirit of being some sort of ersatz stand-in for mechanical Jesus because he failed to show up again... I hope this has been some help to you and might sort of at least nudge you in the right direction when you're fabbing something up with the potential for mayhem in your own fat cave.